So my name is Parvis Saleh. I'm um, from Vader Consulting. Um, we've got Jamie Novak here from CompuCorp, um, and we're going to be doing a split sh a split session. So I'll do the first part of the session, and that will be around uh, sending newsletters in general, um, and a couple of extensions that we've got for sending newsletters via Mailchimp and um, an interface that allows you to send newsletters um, without letting the user break templates. So uh, it's a common, a common issue that we get where end users who actually send the email uh, somehow manage to break templates. So what your customer actually sees or what your donor sees, your supporter sees, isn't the way you quite designed it. So we'll, we'll show a bit of that as well. Uh, I think Jamie's going to show um, easier mailing he's got on his slide, is what I can see, <laughs> and some Mailjet integration. So, so we've, we should get quite a lot of different aspects of mailing and a couple of different approaches to, to how to email. So um, I've got credits here Nic to Nicholas Gav uh, Ganivet. So because I've pinched some of these slides from um, Civicon San Francisco. Um, so the first part of this is purely around um, what you should take into account when you're sending emails. So there's, there, there are different elements. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but obviously these hugely uh, impact what ends up in your uh, customers' inboxes. So it's well worth taking into account the designing process, the composing process, and the actual method that you send. These, these all have an impact on the end result. Um, what we'll be using is CiviMail um, to, to, to throughout this presentation. Um, and obviously, we'll be showing Mailjet and, and Mailchimp as well. Um, so the first thing is design. So in your email design, um, what kind of things do you need to take into account? So obviously, design is important because everybody's using slightly different uh, mail clients. So um, you've got Outlook, Apple, Gmail, Yahoo. There's all sorts of things. There's different things in terms of screen sizes and what people can see and the resolutions they're running. Uh, and it all makes a difference. So these are some of the stats that Nicholas ran out before to show you what, what kind of browsers people use these days, what, what interfaces they use to read their emails. So we can see, actually, the number one is Apple iPhone. So how many of you guys actually take into account that the more, most likely interface that someone's going to open your email is, is actually an iPhone and not Outlook and not a desktop? So these are kind of critical things. When you're designing an email that you're trying to reach everybody with, uh, it's important that you, you keep an eye on this stuff and, and you kind of take that into account. Um, the composing part. So we kind of get ready. We say, OK, we know, we know what our clients are using in terms of their devices. Um, uh, what, what's the problem? Why is it so hard to get it right? Um, the common story is HTML and CSS are standards, which every browser, every client adheres to. Uh, this really isn't true. <laughs> so if we, even if we look at Outlook and the different versions of Outlook, so from 2000 to 2010, the same newsletter going to both, you can see quite a stark difference in them. Um, and that's actually a later version of Outlook and what it's doing and an earlier version of Outlook. And the earlier version is actually doing the rendering properly. So Whenever we, whenever we send out emails, whenever we're talking to our clients, we always use, um, we use third-party tools to test the first few sends. Um, and those third-party tools will show you what that email looks like in all the different uh, email clients. So obviously, you can't fix every single email client. But if you can get 90% of your top 10, then, then you're doing pretty well. Um, and it's mo most likely that what, what, what most of your uh, customers see is going to be a good representation of you as a charity or as an organization, and not a kind of amateurish display that you kind of end up with in this 2010 one. So if I was to see that in my inbox, I'd probably think, these guys have got a few years to go before they're ready for my money, if you like. So it's just bit worth bearing in mind. Sending. So sending obviously causes problems as well. Uh, I, won't, I can't even count the number of clients that we've gone into that haven't realized that their emails are probably not getting through to their clients. Um, there's actually, they actually have no clue that there are spam lists out there, there are blacklists out there, your name, your IP address is registered somewhere if you're not careful. And it's something you should probably keep a regular eye on. It's not hard to check. It's a, quick, a really simple thing to find out if, you're, if your uh, IP address or your domain name's listed somewhere. Um, and 
once it's there, then, then you should look to try and, try and, uh, try and fix that issue. Because your clients aren't going to tell you they're not receiving stuff. It's very, it's very rare. It's normally mem membership organizations where the members will, will ring up and say, I didn't get my membership newsletter. But a supporter, someone who's donated to you, who's fallen off your donor journey, they're not going to ring you because they have no idea that you had them on a donor journey. So keeping on top of this stuff can really make a big difference. Um, it's a bit like Mark was saying earlier in the, in the day when he did his keynote, A-B testing on emails, emails reaching the right people, these are things that can make a 40 to 50% difference on the return uh, in your return on investment, right? So instead of 100,000 pounds raised from emails, you might be talking about 150, um, but you won't know that until you, you actually address these things. Um, and all of these things are fail safes. They're not there to stop your emails getting through. They're, they're there to protect um, your own inboxes. So you don't want to be flooded with lots of requests for $5 to, to, to someone in Africa because you're about to inherit $2 million, so send them 5 and then they'll send you the rest. Um, we don't want that, so that's what this is. these things are all there to protect. <coughs> so again, Nicholas nicely got some stats for, out for us. Um, the percentage of spam email traffic was about 70%. So seven out of 10 emails sent to people were spam. Actually, not, real, not the real thing. So you can see the amount of work that these filters are having to do and how easy it would be for your email to end up in that 70%. Um, and there were malicious files in 4% of all emails. So an email that says, yeah, if you just open this file and complete this form and then we can send you your 10,000 uh, pound prize that you've just won. That's really, you know, us in IT, we, we kind of understand that that's not, that's not a proper email, but lots of people do open them and lots of people get into trouble for them. Um, what's the, what's, what, what happens if your emails aren't getting through? You know, what, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, it's a waste of your time, for starters, because you spend quite a lot of time producing emails, getting into donor journeys, um, getting, the, getting the processes straight. Uh, so if your emails aren't actually getting through to your, to your customers, that's a big waste of time. Um, you've obviously bought software. You're using software to send out emails. If, that, if you're just because you're on a blacklist, that, that software is effectively redundant. It doesn't make any difference that you're sending 100,000 emails. Those emails, you're still paying for the sending process, but they're never reaching, never reaching their destinations. Uh, and then finally, it's the reputation. So we, we ourselves had uh, issues with emails recently. And when you get a reply from someone and it's got a nice spam in the subject, it's pretty embarrassing and it, and it affects your reputation. So you don't, again, to avoid these things, it, it's in your own interest. Um, just a couple of hints and tips on the rules for email design. Uh, there's a virtual, virtual line called the fold, and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, you should try and design your email so the fold, you know, everything before the fold is what you want your customer to see. Um, don't use images in your content. That's a bit of a broad statement, but what it's effectively saying is you don't want the first thing the person sees to be an image that kind of half shows in the iPhone. There's no point in that. Um, so just be careful with your design. Uh, understand what each email client supports. So again, designing rich, rich uh, emails that can't be opened in an iPhone is obviously a, a, waste, a lot of a waste of resource if, if an iPhone is what's used by most people. Um, so take that into account when you're doing it. And comply with the Sp can Spam Act when you're sending. So Civi kind of helps with all of this. So it will force you to have uh, your domain name, a kind of opt-out links, all of that stuff in there. So the Civi will help. Um, in terms of the fold, um, what we're talking about there is, is that the projector? Yes, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so the fold, what we're talking about is that first few lines of the email. So normally if someone opens it in Outlook or if you open it in an iPhone. Oh, sorry. How did you know? It's recording. Yeah. So normally like if you're sending an email, that's what the person's first gonna see. If you've got Outlook and you're using kind of email clients, this is how normally you've set them up. You might have your reading pane on the right, but all that's going to happen is the text is going to, uh, is going to be word wrapped to down and you're still going to have the same sort of space. So really for your marketing email, that's, your, that's what you've got to play with. You don't have 1200 by uh, 768. That's not the screen page you've got. You've got this section here. 
So these are just things to bear in mind when you're, when you're kind of designing and sending. Um, and there's nothing worse than when you get an email in Outlook and it's like that. So if you use a lot of images, this is the possible problem, right? So when an Outlook guy tries to open it, what he sees is a bunch of red X's and are you sure you want to open this email? So is that good? Is that, the, is that what you want users to really think, that your email isn't safe? Um, these are the kind of things you have to weigh up. So above the fold uh, is just talking about where you, where you can use and how you can use that space. So having, having a logo and an attractive newsletter title uh, is going to be better than having a big image in there and, and then having your newsletter content further down. Uh, we've got some examples from Katie. She's, she was around. I don't know where she's gone. Um, but here's an example of the changes made to our own CVCRM newsletter. So the fold on the left-hand side is actually quite low down, um, and it's quite a big header. So our own newsletter was adjusted so that it's CVCRM newsletter, the date, and you can see quite clearly, if you were to look at the fold, you'll see quite clearly what that is. Uh, and then you would go on to read the rest. Um, in terms of CSS, what supports what, there's plenty of tools out there that can tell you what uh, different clients support in terms of CSS, background images, all of that kind of thing. Um, again, well worth a look. Um, so in, in emails, there are two types of email. There's a mass email, so where I'm emailing 1,000 people or, or 10,000 people, and then there's transactional stuff. So if someone donates online, they're getting a transactional email. Um, they're getting a kind of thank you, if you like. So they both have slightly different uh, routes that they take, and they both have slightly different, um, slightly different recommendations in terms of what you do. And, and this is just talking a bit about that. Um, I think so um, one of the things that we've done, um, we've done it with Leukemia and Lymphoma Research, is to help with this kind of thing, to stop people breaking templates by accident, is to produce an extension that has uh, inline editing. Right? So what that actually does is that <coughs> it protects the template. So for, for pretty much every client that I've worked with, their number one complaint is we design these nice templates, but when the, when the actual uh, producers come to put content into those templates and send them out, they never look the same as our designs. Uh, and 99% of that's because the people putting the content in have accidentally deleted a div or changed a table so it doesn't, it doesn't quite look, look, look the same anymore. But they don't know the impact of that because they're not testing it on all the different uh, email clients. It's not their job. You don't want that to happen two or three times or every time someone sends an email. So um, that's down to the HTML editor in CVCRM. It doesn't have any protection of the template. It allows you to edit any part of, of the email. So people are unknowingly uh, kind of breaking it. So what we have is an inline editor. So if I just bring up, if I just bring up uh, this page. So this is, this is a kind of trimmed down uh, bulk emailing uh, page that we've set up for Leukemia and Lymphoma Research. <clears throat> and what you can do in here is just pick the group that you want to email. So we've taken the five steps that you have in, in a kind of bulk emailing, normal bulk email, down to, down to a one page. And you pick the uh, group that you want to email. You name your mailing exactly as you would do. You can allocate a campaign in the same way that you would do. Uh, and the key bit is when you pick up the template, um, so let's use the microphone. So when I pick up the template and edit that template, I'm now kind of stopped from editing all elements of it. So I can edit bits that only that are marked as um, being inline editable. So I can't change stuff that, that the template doesn't want me to change. Um, I'm just going to use a different example. So here, I can change bits of the text in here uh, somewhere. My thing's gone a bit mad, so there's my H's. I can change some of that text, but I can't change anything else. And I can't mess with any of the layouts. I can't move any of the buttons. So it's a way for the emails to be really protected and to stop people accidentally breaking them. Um, and this extension will, will release out very soon. We've just got one or two bits to finish up on it. So if you do have that problem of emails um, 
kind of getting broke. Uh, quick bulk email. It's very aptly named. So, <laughs> um, so we have that. The other solution to these kind of problems, and it's a bit probably why you ended up with Mailjet, is to take the editing of emails and the actual production of the email out of CVCRM. So there are plenty of tools out there that are really good at this sort of thing. Um, so MailChimp is the example that we have. Um, MailChimp, MailChimp's interface for production of email is great. Um, so let's have a look. So I'm logged into MailChimp. That's not what I was. Let's get logged back in. <coughs> so logging into MailChimp, I've got my MailChimp list. Lots of people use MailChimp. They know how the editors work. The production of the email is really straightforward. So if I go back to... Uh, templates. So creation of a template is kind of nice and structured. I get a lot of options. I can't really break the templates. Um, so each of them as and when I pick, <coughs> I can put my content into it. So it's a real rich interface, but it's made, it's made for sending emails and that's all it does, right? So it's sending emails, unsubscribes, managing the lists, etc. So it's kind of all the work of putting, oh, I can't, yeah, all the work of effectively what we've done in line editing, but in a separate product. So a lot of charities have volunteers, have people that are used to using MailChimp, um, and they don't want to transfer them into, they don't want to retrain these people into CVCRM. So what we've done is created a, an extension that allows you to get CVCRM and MailChimp talking to each other. Um, so I'll just close that. So what we have is, if I just go down to system settings. So for those of you who have not done an extension in CVCRM, you simply download the extension from the CVCRM.org site. Uh, and once you've got it and put it into your extensions directory, you'll see it there whenever my machine wakes up. Oh, I can show you here. Okay, so I've got my extension there. I can see a bit of information about it, wh where it came from, and if you hadn't installed it, you'll have an install button. So you simply go through, install that extension, and then what happens is I end up with a few more settings on my mailings menu. So the first one that I need to look at is the MailChimp settings. So in here, I would tell CVCRM what my MailChimp account is. Uh, so every MailChimp account, you can generate a private key, uh, and that key we basically need to give to CVCRM. So that's effectively getting the CVCRM talking to MailChimp. The security key is, uh, is something that we use in the page because we want to tell MailChimp where to send bounces, unsubscribes, where should it send all this stuff. So putting in the security key gives us a URL that we can use and we can put into MailChimp. So in the MailChimp, we have an area to do that stuff, so I'll just show you. So in a MailChimp list, if I go into one of these lists, so in a web MailChimp list in uh, MailChimp, you basically have this thing called webhooks, and webhooks are MailChimp's kind of alerting method. So it's the way that MailChimp will tell third-party systems about changes in its lists. And those changes can be all sorts of things. So it could be subscribes, unsubscribes, profile updates. So if someone's changed their name, um, if there's been an email address change, any of that stuff is recorded in MailChimp and using the webhook is pushed back to CVCRM. So I'm telling it where to push it back to. I'm telling it to push it back to my CVCRM install and I'm telling it that my private key is that so that I don't get requests from other, other people's MailChimp accounts or, or kind of erroneous requests into my database. So once I've set that, um, I then get some options. So basically the way the sync works is um, linking groups in CVCRM to either lists or groups in uh, MailChimp itself. So if I go into a group here, one that I've set up as a mailing list. So I've got, uh, yeah, let's do, actually I'll do that one. 
newsletter subscribers. I've got 61 contacts in my group. I'm just going to go back. And if I go into the settings of that group, what I get as a result of uh, installing the extension are a few extra options down here. So I've got MailChimp settings, and I can say there's no integration at all. I don't sync this group with MailChimp. Leave, leave the email addresses alone. Don't create them. I've got uh, an option that says, OK, sync them, and sync them to a list. So because Civi and MailChimp are integrated now, the lists that I get are the MailChimp lists. So this, if I add a new MailChimp list into MailChimp, the user adds one in, it will automatically show in this drop down. So the two systems are actually communicating with each other. So I can say sync that with my London list. Or the third option I've got is to say sync it with my London list and put it into a specific group. So in MailChimp, you can, you can use groups to segment your data, and that keeps your subscribers list low. So like for below 12,000 subscribers or below 2,000 subscribers, the costing is different in MailChimp. So if you, if you use the groups to segment your data, then you don't pay for more subscribers. So you can have 100 groups in one list, and you just pay for the total number of subscribers. Um, whereas if you use multiple lists, then you're paying for each set of subscribers. So if you've only got a few thousand contacts and you use lots of lists, then you're going to end up paying for that number of lists times the number of subscribers. So that's a slight difference, and it's a slight nuance in, in MailChimp, and it's just something to bear in mind. OK, so if I, say, push it to that, I then get a third option down at the bottom. So, um, so basically, we're saying, what should happen to Civi CRM when someone subscribes or unsubscribes? Do I want that change coming back in or not? Do I want to leave them out? So for instance, I might have a VIP group in Civi, and I want to email that group, so I link it up to a MailChimp account. But if someone unsubscribes from that, that group, I don't want them coming out of my base Civi CRM VIP group. They're still a VIP to me, so I'm going to leave them in there. But the next time we send from MailChimp, they won't receive the, mail, the email because we're not, we're not taking them out. We're just unsubscribing them. So I just save that. OK, let's do the other one. not going to like it, sod's law. So assuming that worked, I could then do a mailing sync to MailChimp. So I can manually push the contacts into MailChimp, or, um, or I can set up a, a scheduled job. So if we look at system settings, is there a scheduled job for that? Is that? Yeah. yeah. It's worth checking. Yeah. So there's a MailChimp background job that gets created as part of the extension as well, which I can set up to run daily, hourly, however, however often I want to sync the groups. Uh, and that will effectively take my CBCRM mailing list and populate it, populate any missing contacts to MailChimp. It will take anything that's in MailChimp that wasn't in CBCRM, and it will just make sure that we've got it all, so all both groups are in sync. OK, so if I was to run that sync, what I would effectively end up with, if I go back to the list, so this is one we did earlier on. <coughs> so I end up with all of my contacts from Civi CRM and their names in MailChimp. Right, so now, if that, if that contact was to receive an email from me from MailChimp, and they went into their MailChimp user record and changed the name or unsubscribed, that information will be fed back to Civi CRM. Okay, so all of that is kind of real time. So if their name changes now, and I then decide to send them a paper letter two minutes later, Civi CRM's information is entirely up to date with that change. There's no delay in the sync back from MailChimp to Civi CRM. So. So that's the MailChimp integration. Um, 
that's a bit more information about transactional versus mass emails. I think that slides in the wrong place, but don't mind that. Uh, and that's basically everything I wanted to show today. I'll rush through it a little bit because I want to make sure that Jamie's got enough time. Um, but hopefully, if you've got any questions about Mailchimp or about email in general, please feel, do feel free to grab me. Um, if not, Jamie. Yeah. Cool. Just to introduce myself, my name's Jamie Novick. I'm here from a digital agency uh, specializing in open source. Our name's CompuCorp. Um, we've been working with Civi for just over four years now. Um, done a lot in that time. Um, so our mission is to raise the awareness of the advantages of selecting open source. So it's fantastic to see uh, so many new faces here today uh, coming out and taking a look at Civi. Um, so some of our clients, just a bit in, big introduction. Uh, one I'd like to point out in particular, because a lot of the work that I'm going to show today is from one of them, the Association of Teachers and Lecturers. So they put a fair amount of funding into developing some of the mailing stuff that I'm going to show you. Um, and I think that one of the messages is that um, you'll see that there's lots of different uh, solutions have come up uh, for this issue around trying to make mailing um, as simple as possible for people to use in Civi CRM uh, in one integrated solution. Cool. Uh, a couple of other slides. So um, I'm going to touch on two of the things that actually I think Parves has, has covered a little bit already. And just some other um, approaches to it as well, which fit into some slightly different circumstances. Um, so in general with Civi, um, what do we want to achieve? Um, in a nutshell, what we wanted to do is to make Civi as easy to set up for mailing as possible. Uh, and this is for bulk mailing, and easy as possible for people to send out the mass mailing as well. Um, so on the first point, Setting up Civi Mail out of the box, it can be a little bit difficult. Uh, I think most people uh, would say that they've gone to a consultant and they've kind of set it up for them. Um, there's a few things to think about. You need to think about your setting up a separate mailbox for Civi, bounce backs, and then some weird stuff, some stuff called local parts, verps. And actually, you have nothing which is maintaining your deliver uh, deliverability. So you're a little bit out in the cold. Um, and I think that's one of the, the, the key kind of messages um, with using Civi out of the box, which is that possibly you want to offload um, the mail deliverability. Um, so one of the things that we've seen here already is using MailChimp for that purpose. And we want to show you just one other uh, approach as well. Cool. So just a little uh, quick conversation about deliverability. If this is kind of uh, new to everybody, then come and talk to us uh, a little bit later, because I won't have a huge amount of time to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, Things that you kind of need to think about or to consider, um, bounce handling, so making sure that if you send out an email, if it goes to an email address that uh, it does bounce, you'll very quickly get yourselves blacklisted if, you, if you're sending out huge amounts of emails to uh, email addresses that don't exist or bounce. Um, throttling, thinking about if you're sending out big bulks of email, if you try and send out a huge amount of emails all in one go, again, the internet's going to look at you and say, well, hang on a second, if we've not heard of this, uh, we've not heard of this server, I'm not sure we want to let all of those through. So you need to think about that. Um, whitelisting. Um, whitelisting is managing to get your uh, server, your, your email sending server, um, so that it's already getting uh, pre-accepted uh, so that people's, uh, the emails go straight into that email address. Um, and there's a couple of te technical points as well, which the internet has kind of come up with around email. Uh, DKIM, SPF, domain keys, and sender ID. Um, the general point here is that, and I don't know if everybody will be aware of this, anybody can send an email as anybody else. So I could today send an email to you as you, and you would receive it, and it would have your email address at the top of it. This information is kind of held in the header of the email, and it's a little bit that's kind of hidden away um, that the, uh, the email client will read, but you guys won't necessarily have full visibility of it. Um, and this is because uh, email was kind of set up at a time before uh, it was thought about it was going to be in such wide use. And it hasn't really moved on from that. So the bots out there in the internet world said, well, how can we secure email and make it so that, um, so that uh, we know that the person who is actually sending this email is who they say they are? Uh, and these are some of the solutions that they came up with, DKIM, SPF, domain key, sender ID. And they can be a little bit difficult to set up in, in truth. There are things you need to think about at your domain level. So you have to put in a key at the domain level. There's some stuff you potentially have to set up on your server. So it's really great if you can offload all of that to somebody else to deal with. Cool. So 
What does that mean? So you have some people out there, and they're called SMTP relays. So that's a case of offloading the sending to somebody else. So rather than you having to worry about your server doing it all, you're offloading that and saying to somebody, OK, great. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send my email to you, and then I want you to send it out to the big wide world. Um, and what's great about these people is that they have deliverability tools. They will help you set up DKIM, SPF, uh, and throttling, get yourself whitelisted because they'll be pre-whitelisted, and all of these things, which helps to make sure that your emails are delivered. Unfortunately, however, there is some extra cost involved to, to using these people. So we did an exercise um, with the Association of T... Oh, ah, and another point, which is that using SMTP relays with Civi CRM can sometimes break the bounce handling. So generally, they alter some of the settings that are up there in that header section so that things don't necessarily come back into Civi and bring that back. So like I said, we did an exercise with the... Uh, Association of Teachers and Lecturers to take a look at the different options out there for SMTP Relay. And we fell on uh, a third-party service called Mailjet. So I'll just show you these people. Uh, or my calculator, one of the two. Uh, why is it doing that? Bear with me one second. It's your screen recording because it's recording the screen, isn't it? How do I end uh, it? Which one do you want to after? I'm after. No. Hmm, Should I want one of the other ones like finally working? Yeah. I think it's I need to stop the recorder. One second. I don't think we can't get it up there because it's. Uh, hang on. Oh, yeah, no, run, run. Um, yeah, ah, great, so cool. So we've got two screens then. So I'm doing something weird. Yeah, but that's not getting me up. I want to be. I want to take this one. Ah. Tapping around. Doesn't let me go up there. Oh, it's down. Okay. Cool, guys. Uh, uh, let's be on one screen, please. Oh. So I'll just show you Mailjet very quickly. So. Mailjet is a, an MTA. Uh, they provide kind of the similar service to uh, similar service to Mailchimp, um, and you're able to integrate into their API very similar to uh, the thing that Parvez just showed you. Um, so what we do is we offload the sending to them. And what I just wanted to show you here is that actually, uh, in terms of kind of the number of emails, um, if you're getting up to significant numbers, Mailjet's actually quite cost effective as a way to offload this comparatively to Mailchimp. If you do have significant numbers of email to send. So in the case of the ATL, they're sending near on a million emails a month, and they're trying to deal with that cost and how they're going to bring that down. Um, so looking at kind of the, the cost per email was really important. Um, so now I'm going to have a bit of a faff trying to get this back together. Hang on. Can I just... Um, Can I just, yeah, I'm just going to take it off this side. Yeah, cool. Do it like that, yeah, that's fine. Oh, this is like, yeah, but I don't, okay. We'll keep it like this for the time being, that's probably easier. Um, so offloading the work onto Mailjet makes your life a lot easier. Um, they've got a very neat interface, uh, and will also track any transactional emails that go out of uh, your Civi CRM. So um, 
Can I just get a rough show of hands for how many people know the difference between kind of a transactional email and a bulk email? So put your hands up if you've got kind of a good... Okay, so that's roughly half. So basically a transactional email is one that isn't going out in bulk, it's reacting to something else that has been sent. So if somebody purchases something, for example, a receipt might be a transactional email, whereas a marketing email would be a bulk email that goes out to, say, 10, 20, or 30,000 contacts uh, in one go. Um, Civi CRM as it stands uh, doesn't do anything with the transactional emails that go out the system. So if somebody puts in a wrong email address, for example, that transactional email could go off to a bounced email address and nothing is handled and you won't know about it. By going through a service like Mailjet or putting somebody behind it, that means that that transactional mail can be caught and you can see that it's, going to, that it's bouncing and that bounce will then get pulled back through. Cool. Sorry about that. Uh, 2.55. So hopefully, by using one of these services, you're nice and warm, looked after, and not out in the cold anymore. So that's the first part. And a little bit like uh, the work that Parvez has been doing with LLR in order to improve the, the way that people are putting emails together. So the first thing being that you want to make sure that deliverability is improved. Um, the second thing about sort of making email simple is about actually creating the email. So we've also built a, a similar extension for managing creation of the emails. So I'm just going to take you through that very briefly as well. This will also be out there in the next couple of weeks for you guys to pick up as an extension for 4.4 and 4.5. Um, so how do we get staff to use this to make mailings look great? MailChimp, but ouch, there's a few cost involves. Civi templates, but they can be a little bit fiddly. Um, so like I said, ATL came to us uh, and looked for us to develop an extension for this. So I'll just show you this one very briefly. So um, you guys are probably all be, uh, any users of Civi will be familiar with kind of the create a mailing screen. Um, here we've got a slightly different one. Um, the idea being that at the ATL, they've got almost uh, 200 staff, and they want to roll out this mailing tool to everybody. And they're not going to be able to train everybody in how to use the whole system. So we had to strip this back and make it as simple as possible for people to use. So there was no chance of them being able to break anything. So here you can see that it defaults to the emails that you've created and gives you an overview of uh, you know, what the, uh, where they're up to, whether they're scheduled, started, or completed. So I'm just going to edit one of these emails. And you'll see it comes up. Do I need to put in a name? So Jamie's email. Oh, oh test my email has come up. Great. And what you can see here is that we've got a built-in screen. Oh, maybe I'll make this a bit bigger. So. Can anybody actually see that? All right. So you've got a screen here for composing your email. Um, so rather than having complete flexibility in the email, what you have here is that you're able to select uh, a logo header, a from address, subject, and compose, um, title, strap line, main body, some contact details, some specific, specific spaces. And what I just want to show you is that that all then gets pre-formatted for you. So you just put the stuff in, you know, in the various sections, and then this mailer will pre-format it for you. Puts in a little reply to button here as well. Those automatically reply to your organization to a specific email address that you can configure. And then the footer element here, which is configured for you as well. So this really takes uh, any possibility of kind of the staff making a mess of the email templates and just plops the data in and lets them send it out. It'll automatically create for you a, uh, a text version as well based on this email, sorts out all the links and things like that. Cool. Next step. Um, yes, you can if you configure it differently, but for them, they didn't want them to be able to do that. Uh, and then, you know, next step, send immediately or schedule a mass mail, uh, so as you would kind of expect, so we can submit that off to sending. I'm not going to do that for now because I'm not sure exactly uh, which emails I'll be sending that to. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so oh yeah, there's the walkthrough. Cool. Uh, so I think I've managed to compress all of that into the 20 minutes that we had. Um, do you have any questions for either Parvez or I around mailing? Yep. Thanks, Jamie. Talk about Mailjet. So there's an existing uh, there's an existing extension for Mandrill for Civi CRM. Uh, I don't know the quite the state of it at the moment, except for that it doesn't fully integrate with the bulk emails. Um, 
I think uh, the um, the decision to go with Mailjet was around the simplicity of setup as well, which was a little bit easier. And at the time, there was also this basis that they were uh, more EU-based so that you could work with them easier. Anyone else? Cool. Uh, well, if that's everything, uh, then we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for coming on.